Well, hello and welcome to our webinar. I'm Bruce Calden with VP of Consulting Services here at Clagan. I'm going to talk about U.S. Tosca PFAS reporting, a lot of the processes. I'm going to have a little uh, wonder after that on another very related topic that uh, is worthwhile getting out there on the PFAS side. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about the Tosca reporting in, in specifics. I'm going to talk about the processes and exactly how to do it. Um, first, I'm going to talk about uh, not the upcoming deadlines. So, when you get the slide, everybody who registered received a copy of these slides, and that line isn't in here because I'm going to talk PFAS, not everything else. Um, I'm going to talk about the PFAS emissions we've done worldwide, explaining a little bit to what's going on. I have a little note, a little sidetrack about the PFOA LCPFCA restrictions. This is PFOA and longer. PFOA is Octa 8. Uh, it's a little. Um, it's actually, strangely enough, PFOA is the same almost chemical as vegetable oil. It's just all the hydrogens are actually fluorine. It's kind of funny. Um, the restrictions of the PFOA and, and in longer worldwide and what's going completely wrong there. And then I can get back into the main topic, U.S. Tosca PFAS report. I'm going to talk about where PFAS is in your products, give you an idea how common and uh, widespread it is. And then I'm going to talk about the steps to Tosca PFAS reporting. I'm going to talk about how we do it process-wise. And I'm going to talk a little bit about CDX, the reporting system, and the fields. So you get an idea. I'm like, oh, those are really pretty fields. Here are your products. Here's the Tosca fields. And then I'm going to talk about the three major steps to get from um, your products to these pretty fields in the U.S. Tosca system in uh, CDX. So I'm going to talk about phase one, identifying PFAS in your products and how we do it. And because what's important, because like everything, anybody who's really uh, listened to us for a period of time uh, understands that what we focus on are initially, almost in everything we work on, is what's the output? So it's going into CDX and here are the fields. And once you look at the output fields, you're like, wait a second, there's certain things at the product level that really don't make a difference and other things to make a huge difference. So we identify PFAS and products, then we make chemical templates because of the federal system, you're reporting chemicals, not products. You're reporting PTFE, not refrigerators. And I can explain all that. And then how you merge your sales data into the templates. And especially a lot of this merging not only is needed, um, it does actually simplify some of the detail. We get asked lots of questions like, what if we, you know, part of the refrigerators we sell, we import some, we, we incorporate here. And if we incorporate it, somebody else is really importing half the parts. So we only import half the parts for it. How do we handle that? I'm like, there's an easy way to do that, actually, without uh, overburdening yourself. Um, and then I talk a little bit about state level reporting. So everything we're doing here can be modified into like the state of Maine or state of Minnesota. There's still some field questions. Um, some of the fields are too high level still without enough detail, uh, but we can map into that. And then I'm going to talk about quoting and costs and stuff like that. Now there will be a Q&A. So there is a Q&A panel. So if you've got a question, feel free to throw it in there. Um, and we'll be happy to answer it at the end. So by the way, we're the global experts in PFAS. I am arguably the world's expert on PFAS in Article. Um, there might be another one. But I'm pretty sure, actually, it's, no, it doesn't get me invited to a lot of uh, dinner parties, and 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 um, it's not how my kids introduce me to friends. They mostly just think I'm awkward. But um, we're definitely the first in knowledge. We know more. We're first in processes. Not only you know do we know stuff, we can actually take this no stuff and make it actually work. And we're first in experience. We have tremendous data. It's one of the reasons why you see in a moment we were uh, recommended and submitted to the United Nations uh, on this topic very recently, like a week or two ago. So uh, anybody's involved before in our, our PFAS restriction or a PFOA or currently unavoidable use projects we've submitted uh, on PFAS in the last four months, probably, uh, the European Union to the US EPA, which is in CDX, is actually the same system you report, uh, you report your product data in next year, uh, the state of Maine, the uh, state of Minnesota, but also Canada and their PFOA restriction coming in next year, and Australia and the PFOA restriction coming in next year. And one of the key things doing all these submissions is, um, it is, when they read it, it is, I wouldn't say it's disbelief on their hand, but it, it, it completely changes everything they originally thought. I mean, a lot of, a lot of the stuff they have, they've been copy pasting each other for a decade and, and the data a decade ago wasn't, wasn't based on any testing and it was a decade ago. And, uh, you can see definitely been copy pasting each other for way too long or the quoting science papers, like say, Hey, the science papers in 2023, I'm like, yeah, but it's 2019 data. 2015 data, not, not the way it is today. So uh, one of the things we're talking to them is we have 2023 data, 2024 data. And that's why our stuff is different. It's not what they think it is. And 
we're talking PFOA. So if Canada bans PFOA next year, like the EU has, um, you will have no more internet and email and laptops and winter clothing, which in Canada is kind of a very awkward thing. I'm not sure which is more important, the laptop or winter clothing. Probably winter clothing. You won't have anyone. Um, and that's because of uh, PFOA is unintentionally in most of those products and for very specific reasons. And they're very specific and they're not, not fixable, but they're not fixable overnight. Um, and, and when talking to a lot of these countries, Canada and Australia and the EU, they're like, well, why doesn't, you know, the EU have this? Why doesn't in the Stockholm Convention? I'm like, it's new data. So we got I recommended and we did submit to the UN Stockholm Convention. So the source of all this uh, last week and saying, and now it's on the official record. Um, and they're basically talking about PFOA. And every situation they're talking about PFOA, the Stockholm Convention is, is old situations, but it's added. Everything we're talking about is PFOA is never added to products anymore. It is a, uh, not to physical products. It's a byproduct of something to do with the very specific polymers and very specific reasons. It's not like, hey, PTFE degrades into PFOA. Um, it's because it was irradiated or otherwise cross-linked and the fracturing to create rubber created. And it's a very specific reason. Or it, you know, it was fractured so you could stretch it to make EPTFE, extended PTFE fiber, your cortex type fiber, and it's the fracturing that created it. Um, and it's not added, it's the fracturing that created it. And explain and say, this is why it fails in the EU. EU, their PFOA, LCPFA, CA is at a physical product is, is basically a complete failure. Um, there are millions and millions and millions and millions in products uh, not compliant on the market in the EU because neither knew it's there and supplier data didn't have it. And that's also one of the reasons why the Stockholm Convention didn't have it. And we had explained to him, so basically, and we explained something to Canada and Australia who are on a ban PFOA, and I'll explain that in a moment next year and longer. I'm like, well, if you do, you won't have internet. You have to, you will, you have to move all your internet servers to China, which is an awkward whole conversation, especially in the US right now. But that's the only way you can comply because you can't have the server without it because of the venting. It doesn't mean you can't fix it, but it'll take years. It's not, it's not a simple thing. Um, otherwise, you, you won't have the thing that stores the data in the server, which is the whole point. Um, so we submit, it's kind of when we submitted to the UN Stockholm, it's a very specific form. That means we have to squeeze everything into the fonts for a little while uh, into the actual field saying, hey, is there any other exemptions you need? I'm like, yeah, there's like eight, I think there's 10 um, unavoidable uses right now of PFOA. And they're not, that they're adding, nobody's adding PFOA to anything. Nobody's adding um, uh, PFOA to anything. It's, it's literally, there's about four or five situations um, where the polymer degrades into it. And it's not like, hey, your frying pan degrades into PFOA, which it never does. You're it's so funny. Every time we have a, like a newspaper, or even a science article, first paragraph talks about PFAS and frying pans. I'm like, the frying pan, I need, like, it's almost like they're doing repeat after me with, with sometimes the government official. The frying pan does not contain nor degrade into any PFAS ever found in drinking water or humans. But like, that's the whole point. I'm like, no, no it's, you guys should test. Um, it doesn't, even under high temperature. It's other things. Is it is it the, the foundation in bronzer or concealer you're wearing? Yes, absolutely yes, it is. Um, last time, and so anybody knows our monthlies or quarterly. So by the way, anybody who likes what we do here, I really, really, really suggest our quarterly or monthly updates where we sit down with you and your company, explain what's changed, not just on this and ROHS, the new exemption consultation in, in the fall or the new two reach SVHCs in consultation, which are super common. Uh, Dicumal peroxide is in tons of your rubbers. Uh, Triphenylphosphate is one of the most common halogen free flame retardants. Explain where it is and how you do it. Um, we're going to be talking, uh, we're actually going to talk about what's in treatment water. And uh, one of the things we're going to talk about is uh, uh, the state of Kentucky is really interesting because well, there's lots of reasons that Kentucky is interesting. But for the, for PFAS, is, uh, they tested all their water wells and they published and they had a wide amount of PFAS data, which is fantastic. So you can actually look at it and you can tell in each situation where there's PFAS in a well where it's from. Because in, in, when we look at, we've tested enough things, we know there's a pattern to it. There's a reason why um, you get certain combinations and you can tell. And, and there isn't a combination in all 113 wells, which is product related. Not physical product. Cosmetics, yes. Firefighting foam, absolutely. Coal mining, absolutely. Um, definitely gets even coal mining. It's how you. Um, one of those coal mining is the dust uh, can uh, get flammable and explode. So they use surfactants. They use fluoro surfactants to do that. So when you have a big coal mining area like the Western Kentucky coal field, you get some interesting stuff, um, which is not unexpected. 
But a lot of it's actually, so when you look at it in until 2022, until all the PFOA restrictions, when you had foundation or concealer or bronzer, by the way, almost all forever chemicals we found the water supplier because of, of cosmetic, um, is um, they use C9 to C15 fluoroalkyl phosphate, which is PFOA. It degrades very quickly. The average um, foundation or concealer the concentration of PFOA is 5,000 times higher concentration than we've ever measured uh, PFOA in the worst EPTFE. And EPTFE, which is a Gore-Tex, is hydrophobic. Water doesn't get near it. It doesn't, can't come out because the water doesn't get near it. And it's it's 5,000 times lower concentration. Makeup, on the other hand, this this uh, the source is how many, what percentage of the population, you think in the US or Canada, wears uh, foundation or concealer? Say 10%. And then takes a shower regularly, probably most of those. That stuff goes right down the drain and 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 it dissolves in water in the PF1. And so that one is a 5,000 times higher concentration, dissolves right into water, and it's used by, say, 10% of the population. So, yes, that was the problem. And that problem's gone away with the, PF, the PFOA ban. So lots of stuff like that. And we try to explain that towards the, the authorities. And it's uh, there, there's some, it, it's sometimes a little hard to explain that everything you've been doing is wrong. Um, it's awkward. And the other, the other part that's really interesting to say is my business are here has every financial motivation for more restrictions. We do. However, and if we're telling you that certain restrictions are a bad idea, you should listen because it's actually not in our best interest to tell you that, but it's true. So if we're telling you like it's so bad that, um, that you really should listen. So that's part of all of this. Thing. And so th there is a lot of, they almost, it, it's useful when I get them all in a room and talk to them all together, it's very enlightening because the nice thing about PFAS is it, it is very tangible. Like you can point at it and like you can look at, hey, the tag in the back of your shirt, that's got a, a floral acrylate coating most of them. Um, and I talk about your laptop. You can't have a laptop anymore without PFOA uh, being allowed for a period of time. There's ways to design around it. It's just not tomorrow because there's PFA polymer. So PFA is different than PFAS. PFA is perfluoroxyalkane. It's the, the material on the wires that go from your um, motherboard to your screen. Uh, you can get versions that don't have PFOA in it versus the ones that do, but they have the exact same cast number. So they're the same chemical from all you know reporting point of view, but they're actually different in structure. It's like PTFE and EPTFE, expanded PTFE, have the same cast number, even though they're structurally quite different. Um, so by the way, so PF PFOA, which I'll get into the Tosca stuff in a moment, um, but this is kind of present because chances are most of you have products that are illegal in the EU right now. It'll be legal in Canada and Australia. Um, and there's ways to design around it, but if they, unless they listen, um, yeah, it's a, it's a huge problem. Um, if you have ever had the word PFA or if PTFE tape, your product's basically banned right out of your stop ship. Um, so it needs to be fixed. So right now they're banning 25 parts per million PFOA and longer. Uh, in the EU, it's already banned except for medicals 2025. Australia is is banning at 2025. Canada is in 2025. Now, there's theoretically going to be one ppm, which is more realistic for unintentional levels, uh, but not in all cases. So it would allow it half the time. Um, but they might probably going to reduce down to 25 parts per billion because the Stockholm Convention said that's okay, which it's not. Um, so one of the neat things about in, in the Canada and Australia consultations, they often had a, a you know one fabric company saying, hey, our stuff's Oikotex certified, therefore we don't have PFOA. And they said, well, the only guys responded, so there's no PFOA in fabric, so we don't need it. We have now measured every single children's winter glove that we've got a hold of in the Canadian market in 2024 has PFOA. Every single one. Every single hard drive on the market today in 2024 has PFOA above the glove. Every single one. It's because of the vent, by the way. And they're actually for the same material reasons. Well, one said that the fabric's because of fluoroacrylate. And there's a reason for that. And the one on the vent, the hard drive, is because it's banded PTFE and, and fracturing the, the PTFE polymer to stretch it, to make it into a fiber. Um, it's not on purpose. It's literally just unintentional. And it can be made without it, but it, it's not going to happen tomorrow. It just takes, you take some effort to find out where it is and then how to replace it and qualify the replacements, et cetera. So um, basically, these substances gets cre uh, are banned in uh, Europe already. Um, however, we've had an interesting discussion with a Swedish enforcement agency. They're not aware of how prevalent it is. Now they have a better warning. They might go enforcing it, and this could be really exciting because you won't have electronics uh, anymore in Europe.
and in Canada in 2025. You're gonna have to move all servers out of Canada too um, because the hard drive that stores the data uh, needs it. It can be designed without it, but not in month. So by the way, so if you look over in your product, if you have the PFA polymer, fluoroxyalkane polymer, PFA wire is super common, 75% uh, chance you have PFA over the restricted limit or 25 parts per billion. It can be made without it. There's a whole, and it, it goes through the chemistry. Um, the reason is it has a very weakly bonded side chain, uh, basically PFA uh, that pops off. And, and that's where PFA comes from. You can have PFA polymer made with only shorter versions, which by the way, the shorter and longer versions didn't cast number, so can't tell them apart. Um, and the, the more useful ones, the one that, that's got PFOA more often, it's more flexible. 75% um, chance it has, it's, it's above the restricted limit. EPTFE, like your, um, so if you have uh, the vents on your hard drive has it, uh, you have a waterproof, a water resistant electronic that's sound. The, um, if you have sound, air leaves your, your device, but you can't, if you're water resistant, water can't get back in. So you have EPTFE, 80% chance. 90% uh, chance, 90% chance it's it's got PFOA above the limit. Cross-link PTFE, PTFE tape. The PTFE tape anywhere. It can be made without it, but almost always the fracturing of the bonds to, to create the rubbering hazard. Uh, fluoroacrylate coatings, which is the uh, fluoro coatings, water-resistant fabric. But imagine you have a medical device and you have a, a bag, fabric bag that it goes into, probably water-resistant, going to be fluoroacrylate with PFOA above the limit. They're all banned. Now, they shouldn't, they, it's okay to ban them, but it's not okay to ban them right away. It's something where it's basically, yeah, they need some years. You just need some time to fix it. It's fixable and it's annoying to fix it. I am sure having to redesign all these materials to find them and redesign them will be annoying, but it's not something that's be done overnight. It's just a matter of being reasonable. And in every case, you and your suppliers are not adding PFOA to it. Every single one of these cases, it's because of an aspect of the polymer is degrading artificially in it, usually in oxygen, um, in air, not that anybody added it. So it's not there on purpose. Nobody's adding a PFOA on purpose, except for like some very specific reagent chemicals, like for laboratory use. Um, but in your physical products, nobody's adding PFOA, but it's there all the time, unintentional. And they just need to have some reasonableness. But if they don't, by the way, be ready. Um, everybody's products are bad. So one of the things we have to, you know, they said, well, we, it's really hard to make these exemptions because not everybody able to do it. I'm like, okay, that means you have to move all your internet servers to China. You can't have laptops. You can't have cell phones. You won't have winter clothing, no heart surgeries, no biopsy. One of us is going to have to tell the public. So here we are. Um, and it's going to take a little, it's going to take some, some movement. Now, by the way, these exemptions for this problem, if they do accept them, aren't going to last that long. So you're gonna really need to get on this. So that's why I'm, so I'm gonna get a toss reporting of Saxon. I'm gonna say this is, so if you look, say your EPTF is 90% chance of being non-compliant. Any component in your product has about a 0.2% chance of being non-ROHS compliant. It's a very different uh, scaling of problem here. And if you have two PTFE tapes in your product, you're pretty guaranteed to be non-compliant. And it could be, it could be anything. So again, like, Every single hard drive in the market right now has it. Everything we've tested doesn't mean there can't be one that doesn't have it. Your hard drive, you've got a hard drive in your product, your hard drive manufacturer, it's not compliant. Uh, PFA wiring, not compliant most of the time. It can be made without it actually because the side chain can be smaller. Uh, PTFE membrane or vent, not compliant. Water resistant fabrics, not compliant a lot. Now, it's waterproof breathable. That's a high percentage. Waterproof non breathable, like PVC. Sure, it's waterproof, but it's not breathable. And PTFE tape is, is not breathable 80% of the time. So this would be a stop ship in the EU right now in Canada and Australia next year, irrespective of what your suppliers are saying. Because this is unintentional, they're not adding it. Or the worst, they use like full material declaration, which will never, ever, 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 ever reflect this. Because um, it's below 0.1%. Um, the product's not compliant. We test all the time. It's hilarious. We can do it by sight. So the point is, uh, to prove a point to the Canadian government uh, this year, um, we went and bought, I think, every single kid's glove we could, in the winter glove in the Canadian market, and every single one has PFOA. So <laughs> it's not like, hey, some of them didn't know they all do. I think we might find one that doesn't someday, uh, but the kids' ones all have it. Adult ones, most of the time. Kids' one all the time. So anyways, back to the main topic. So that one's exciting. Um, just you're gonna have to, I, I would get on that. And if, and if you do this project with us, the PFAS reporting, we can definitely get you right down the right direction. Because where 
the PFOA is, is blatantly obvious to us, even before testing, because it, it has, it's in certain materials, we can tell what material it is. And you need to know what material it is for PFAS for it. So, um, so, so, and everybody probably who talks to you about the Tosca PFAS, I'm sure people like to blather on about it uh, a lot. Um, I mostly enjoy it. Um, cool. So, you always have a slide like this, say here are the main high level things, which, which we're going to do too. So, companies must report, and it's a link to the legislation. Now, the neat thing, neat in a boring kind of way, um, very boring. The, the way the U.S. and Canadian legislation is mostly written is usually the government creates some, like, like the Congress, uh, the U.S. creates some kind of very simplified rule and says, hey, the EPA now or the SEC for Compton Minerals or whomever um, has to create the final rule, the real detail. And so the, the EPA can do that as long as they follow, follow rules of their own. Otherwise, it could be struck down in court. And some of the big rules are they have to say what they proposed. They have to show what industry's feedback was, and they have to show they address the feedback. And if they don't, the whole thing can be struck down in court. So this, like, this task reporting can be struck down in court if they didn't go through all that, which means the final rule has all that stuff in there. And you're like, where am I going to get to something useful? So if you're looking at the task reporting rule and you want to go to something useful, look up the word streamlined. Because that's the, the method for reporting for physical products for articles, the streamlined. Once you view, if you search for streamlined, you'll find the parts that really apply. They'll actually say, hey, you have to do A, B, C, and D. And you're like, that would be really handy, like on page one, not page like 32. Um, but conflict minerals, final rule is kind of similar that way. Um, but so you look for the word streamlined and you get much more information. So you have to report your, your PFAS importation or manufacture volumes back to 2011. So basically 2011 to 2023. Uh, the deadline, if, if you, including your parent company, of over $120 million sales a year, it's May 8th. Um, if you're $120 million, it's November 12th next year. Now, um, there's actually some other caveats in it, but the most of the caveats are pretty rare situations. So these are the main uh, caveats in your reporting date. Uh, where's PFAS and products? Everywhere. Um, the fan there, it's the anti-drip agent, like the ABS, uh, meet UL, uh 94B0 or the outer housing and vacuum cleaner. Uh, but your labels have it. Most of your safety labels are floral coded. So they're indelible and they don't, so the, the, the important safety warnings don't come off. Even your barcodes are normally floral coded. Water resistant fabrics, um, the release agents for your gaskets. If you have a screen, there's an anti-smudge, anti-reflected uh, layer. Um, if you have a high temperature product, like most electronics, dense electronics get quite hot. They have PTFE or more likely PFA wires, uh, your fry pan. So whenever we have a news article, it always talks about fry pan. A. Your fry pan has one floral. It's the coating on the outside. Your laptop has 20 plus uh, floral parts in it. Um, second, the frying pan has no PTF, no PFAS in it that ends up in water, nor does it degrade into it. It's not really what we should talk about right now. Uh, PTFE tape, everything. But also wire lubrication, bottom right, those hookup wires of their PVC will actually gr um, grip each other. So if you floral spray them, uh, they won't grip, and the, the cable is more flexible and lasts longer. Uh, that's why we see it everywhere. The antenna in your phone, the, or your tablet, it's got a connection point for the antenna. That little clip-on connection point has a PTFE dielectric in it because PTFE has the best dielectric constant of materials. So it's a good reason why we have it. Um, so what do you want to look at? What you have to report is if your physical products, which we're focused on, chemicals is a slightly different creature, and you have to do the streamlined reporting. So what I'm going to talk about today is streamlined. And so when I mentioned earlier, if you want to find stuff you have to do in the law, look up the word streamlined. Way better. Um, and you have to report on what's reasonably ascertainable, which is an interesting open mind. You don't have to be perfect. And you need to report the chemical, not the product. So that's a key thing I'm going to speak about here. You're not reporting refrigerators. You're reporting PTFE. Everything in this system is built for chemical manufacturers. Article manufacturers are included more recently because they don't want to give benefit to companies to get their chemical work done, say, in China, and then bring the product in afterwards. It's, it's an unfair disadvantage to local uh, chemical uh, companies. So therefore, that's why articles are in scope. However, the entire system is written for chemical manufacturers. That's why you're reporting chemicals. You're reporting PTFE. You're not reporting refrigerators. They level it's a bit different. You're reporting refrigerators or, or at least at the customs code the brick code level um that's a whole different other topic um you report with ptfe the volume and the number of products or kilograms and we do what we give our pounds really um we, we give you options to do both and some use information or pull down menus and we'll show all of that and i'm going to show some specific examples it's a very high level but one of the things you have to understand you're reporting ptfe not refrigerator not you're not reporting hey we make you know this kind of laboratory equipment cool but you're not reporting laboratory equipment you're reporting ptfe and fkm 
a commonly called Viton, uh, FFKM, CalRes, et cetera. Those are all different uh, PFAS. So reporting requirements. Um, caps are going to report the actual um, PFAS, which is always a fluoropolymer or a rubber. Um, you won't be reporting PFOA because it's only intentionally added, and PFOA is not intentionally added to any physical product. Even a main, and it includes manufacturing aids. Like So there is a capstone style, that's a name brand like Kleenex, um, six fluorine uh, surfactant, very complicated chemical family uh, used as the emulsion polymerization to FKM, so floral rubbers. Um, however, it, it's used there for emulsion polymerization and has no function in the end product, so it's not really intentionally added. So you wouldn't even uh, report that. But you report the FKM. Uh, your import value of volume, the number of units or the pounds of PTFE. And I'll show both options. Then you have to do what its use is and your all incorporation in physical product, basically, which is you. If it's a refrigerant tank, it's a little bit different. Uh, what sector you're in, and most people for chemicals, but there are a handful that are your sector, probably one or two options, like electrical equipment, appliance, component manufacturing. Um, a product category, machinery, mechanical, appliance, electrical. Um, there's probably maybe three that could apply to pretty, unless you make, you know, clothing is a different category for that. Um, and then you have to use functional, what, functional use. It's pull down menu like F034 insulators. And then what percentage uh, of each function is your PTFE? So it's 50% insulators, 25% flame retardant, et cetera. And then whether it's consumer commercial intended for children and what's the max concentration of the product. The max concentration of the product, like everything is chemical based. So it's like an SDS is down to 0.1%, 0.1 0.1 to 1% of the whole physical product, like the refrigerator. 1% to 10% and 10% to 100%. And again, I apologize if I'm speaking very quickly. It's a habit. Uh, I like to say, like, witty, I'm not speaking too fast. You're listening too slow. But no, it, it's me. It's definitely me. Um, I'm, I speak too quickly. And I apologize for that. My mom mentions it a lot. I think she just gets tired of, of saying what. Um, so what are you the reporting? If you do, it's in CDX, which is similar system to CDR. So CDR, if, you, if you're basically looking at the, uh, the eruption part, say the affluent from your factory in PFAS9, that's CDR. It's a different system. It's in CDX. I know, they look very similar. So when you report in CDX, it's going to be an individual that reports, not the company. So imagine you work for Acme. I'm going to use Acme a lot. Hopefully it's not a real company. Uh, I just think more of, of uh, Roadrunner and such, but if uh, in Wiley Carrier. Um, if you're reporting for Acme, um, Acme doesn't report, actually. Uh, John Smith, who's maybe an employee for Acme, he has to get a code. And if you're a U.S. citizen, it's pretty easy because you can get one based on your social insurance number. But if you're not a U.S. citizen, you can still report, but you have to basically snail mail some notarized stuff to prove you are who you are to the EPA. And then they have to confirm that you're in. And sometimes you just magically get a password. It's pretty funny. Uh, I'm not I'm not a U.S. national, even though I grew up there. Um, so I had to go through that system. So uh, you, you end up getting the individual, then the individual, the company then has to give documentation to prove the individual is part of the company, then you're connected to the company, but the report is by the individual. And if the individual leaves the company, the company is responsible to sever in CDX uh, the user ID. By the way, the Canadian system is basically the same. If you have to report for Section 71 under CEPA, it's an individual using their own individual GC code, which is related to a bunch of other personal things um, attached to the company. And when they leave the company, the company is most to make sure they sever it. Uh, the U.S. system is the same. So you're reporting in CDX. It's going to be a user ID of an individual person. Now, we can actually attach our ID to or my ID to you, but you're going to want to probably keep it. So we normally recommend is you have your own ID individually with the company. And then when you do it, we can basically, if you have any questions about it, we can web meeting in with you and just do it there. Um, so what do you report? We do it in three phases, steps. First, got to figure out what PFAS to have in your products. And a lot of people try to use your Solar data, but one of the reasons we had to also to submit to the UN Stockholm Convention, Solar data is completely wrong. Um, there's some pros and cons. There's a lot of problems with Solar data. Not only is it mostly wrong, it's also in so many different formats, it's difficult to use. Um, so it, 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 we're not a big fan. It also takes too long. We find it takes too long, costs too much money, and the quality is crap, which is basically everything we're against. Anybody who's really worked with us, we're a big fan of getting the best quality and output for the least effort. When we want to get good, it has to be good. We don't, we, we have a lot of quality standards, especially because we have a lot, uh, it has to be good. Um, but we don't want to spend unnecessary effort. And a lot of things about this, you can go down a big unnecessary effort uh, path. So we usually use representative testing. So by the way, if you work with us, you say, well, testing kind of expensive. Actually, this is what it is. You want to do the whole project, We'll tell you how much it costs, exactly what we're going to do. And don't worry about whether it's testing or not. It's actually just we find it faster and cheaper. Um, and it's far more efficient. It's a lot easier to do. 
Um, so we use represent product testing. It's just faster and more accurate, uh, which we're a big fan. I'll explain that in a bit. So then we have to figure out what's in your product. Then um, we have to build the chemical templates because you're reporting PTFE and FKM. You're not reporting refrigerators. So we have to report templates for the chemical, take your data and make chemical data templates, uh, which I'll show some examples in a bit. And in phase three, we have to merge your sales volume. And there's a way we do that. And it's kind of neat because it also deals with a lot of other problems. Like saying, well, you know, half the refrigerators we import ourselves and half we incorporate here, and maybe 25% in the ones we incorporate here, we import the parts ourselves. How do we handle that? I'll show you. It's basically saying, you'll see that in a minute. And it's kind of neat. And uh, it removes you worrying about deep, important things. And so you say, hey, well, what if it's, you know, really 55%, not 60% responsible for it? Part of the things you're reporting are things like related to what is the weight of the outer jacket of a 16 gauge PFA wire? There's a lot of error on that number. <laughs> like, we give a good guess. That error, the number is going to swap little details about what percentage of, of your components you import uh, versus somebody else for the most part. And there's a way to handle that. Um, so, but one of the questions you're going to have to decide by the end, and, and we definitely recommend deciding one way off the bat, but you can change your mind later. Is whether you're going to report is the parent company or operating company. Imagine Acme, parent company, owns a Thurman Spools and uh, Benson laboratory devices. They're quite different. Um, and they operate differently, they sell differently, have no customers really in common, or you know, no sales teams in common, or very few. Um, you normally do the work at the operating company. You do, you know, Thurman, um, let's say valves and, and Benson uh, laboratory equipment. You, you do the work there. Now you can merge them together and report as Acme or you can report as Thurman or Benson. We normally structure, it's just structure the work like you're reporting separately. You can always merge it later because um, they're going to have the, the different operating companies usually have different product sales. Um, the product sales are not reported together. They have different representative products. And when you're trying to do everything that's like Acme, you can't report to the slowest companies then. And the funny thing is you could also have it. So Acme, if you have five business units, Acme reports for two and the other three report by themselves. It's also easier to separate them later if it comes down to it. And at the end of the day, if you have the different reports for all five you know, operating companies, you can merge it back into one Acme one. Um, but that's one you're gonna have to look at. So even you, and as long as it's reported, DP doesn't care if the parent company's reporting or the operating company's reporting. So it could be a combination. I, I suggest doing, we suggest doing the work at the operating company, levels guided, guided often by the parent, uh, especially if there's some guidance there. And then um, you don't have to decide 100% to the end. So if you do, you do it as the operating company initially, you can decide to merge it later. It's just paperwork. So um, talk about why we do representative testing. Um, so what we do is we choose representative products from each product line. I'm like, well, how do you do it? That's actually pretty easy. You contact us. We will literally send back, this is what we recommend in pictures and details and costs. Um, and then sometimes you make some suggestions, maybe not that one, maybe this is better. Are these really the same thing? Or we don't make that anymore. It's not really that recommended. Make a few modifications and that's what we do. So when we, we do propose a quote, we basically, this is exactly what we do off of pictures um, and make it happen. It's this cost. So you don't, in fact, it's, it's product testing. We just find it's a lot easier and better and cheaper. Uh, the reason we also do it is it's way more accurate, the supplier data, especially with PFAS. The supplier data of PFAS is awful. Um, lower effort than supplier data. It's just so much easier to do. It's one of the reason we got, I mean, we got out of doing data gathering a long time ago because we knew the data was a lie, especially through the testing. And we have a lot of quality and we can't, it was, it was late. There were gaps in the data always, and it was mostly a lie. And it, it, it just felt wrong. Um, where we can test it, and I know it's not a lie, and there's a lot more detail to it. And there's time certainty. It's faster. Doing testing is actually faster with time certainty. So, you know, it might be only maybe six weeks instead of four weeks because we, you know, bogged down the lab or something like that. But you, we'll tell you when and it's be done then. Uh, data is consistent. It's easy to merge in chemical templates. Next thing about the testing is everything like we do is we structure it for the output. So it's so much easier to put the data together. We got supplier data. And we know it's not very truthful and huge gaps. And we're like, okay, now how do we put it back together? Because we don't really care it's PTFE. I care it's PTFE for this use. So then I'm just reporting PTFE is like not that handy in some cases um and it's much easier and and ptfe is multiple cast numbers and it's really confusing um it's and it's easier to the test data to process for federal or state requirement we just rework it 
So that's what we do. We just find it works better. We're just looking for a process that gives the output. Again, we're focused on the output. That's why we do it. Um, now, if it's really valuable products, like, why do I want to test my truck or baking? Yeah. Or my expensive, you know, $40,000 laboratory equipment. Right. So what we're going to do is a little bit different. We're going to combine that. We're going to do a bomb review. And the reason we do a bomb review is there are certain materials that are blatantly obvious. You have PFA wires. I'm not going to test for PFA wires. It says right there, PFA wire. I will take that and put that in. Um, you're going to have some complex COTS, from a catalog off the shelf parts, like a laptop. Well, over the last 12 years, you might have very different laptops over this time where you use a generic declaration for laptop. Now, if you make a laptop, different story, different level of intensity. Uh, but laptops are super complicated uh, PFAS. And in a lot of cases, it's going to be redundant with your main products data, strangely enough. And then we test representative parts saying, oh, all this is great for the bomb, but the parts that's going to be unknown is that piece, that piece, and that piece. And we want to test at least, you know, eight to 10 of those. Here are the ones we'd like, like of these 10 parts, we'd like at least eight of them. And that should fill in data. Again, it's only reasonably ascertainable, so perfection is not needed. Um, also, you find duplicate information is not that terribly useful for reporting. Like, how many times do you have a PFA wire is actually not that handy because it gets dwarfed by, you know, the theoretical estimate of how thick the wire, the PFA wire is or how heavy it is. Um, some PFAS is used to blatantly obvious from bomb. You have, you have PTFE tape, it does it right there. Now, you might have PFA, that's a different problem, but you have PTFE tape that's being used for as a lubricant. So I'll just put that in or as a sealing material. Perfect. Um, and sometimes full and, and full large testing is very duplicate. It's the largest thing we test normally, like slot machine size we do. Even then, after a while, there are very certain parts that are very important, that have much higher risk for certain regulations. But after that, it's very repetitive. Um, so we're really focused, especially with PFAS, where you're reporting PTFE and the highest concentration of PTFE in your product. If you have a situation where it's above 0.1%, concentration of product, that's probably the highest concentration you're going to get. And so the other parts really don't affect it much other than the function. But you need to know the function like that's an insulator, that's seal. Those are major function differences. How many seals? You need to know roughly um, for percentage pur purposes, but you'll find we start playing with the data. There are a lot of other assumptions and numbers that move things around that aren't that significant, that affect the end volumes more than 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 the fine detail so don't go down a super rat hole it's not necessary not useful um so then we have to create chemical chemical templates um this kind of example we're looking at you build it per um pfas ptfe is a different cast number than fluorolastomer some like floral acrylates don't have a cast number they're very complicated soup they have ascension numbers ascension numbers are company specific so you can't really use them so they're basically just called floral acrylates um that's the uh, waterproof coating of fabric uh, for example, uh, fluoroacrylate is also uh, a sealing coating inside, you know, certain capacitors. It's about a fairy wings amount in a capacitor, um, half a Tinkerbell, but uh, it's there. So um, again, you're reporting PTFE. So we create templates for everything you can report. So these are the fields you can, they're pull down menus, by the way. These are the fields you're going to report. Most of these, a few extra, I'm going to explain them all. We start with the chemical side, which is really cool. And then we have to merge in your sales volume. Because you have to report the number of units or kilograms or pounds uh, or tons uh, per year back to 2011. So the way we do that is for every template we build in for each of the representative product families, whether they have the PTFE. And you say, hey, product family one has all every product in that family, more or less, has 100 percent of PTFE. Perfect. Product family two, perfect. Product family three is a certain, you know, we're selling these valves. These valves are all PFA based, not PTFE or whatever, zero percent have it. Awesome. And product family four, um, some of them do, some of them don't. This is a, our, our food processing, uh, consumer food process equipment. Some have PTFE, some don't. So it's like, say, 75%. Or um, the product always does, but we import, you know, half of them, half the blenders from China. They're responsible for all those. The other half we incorporate here. Of the ones we incorporate, we basically import half the parts ourselves. Okay, so you have 50% and then half of 50%, 75%. So it allows you to blend all this complicated, like, well, how about, you know, this one we incorporate here and this one we bring in. Let's talk to the top level numbers and we adjust it up here. So how much of each product, how much, how many, what percentage of the products in these product lines have these, have PTFE in it and roughly. And then, so again, we're looking at these percentages, a really neat way to look at it. And then what you do, and, all, and so we build all the template 
what you have to do is give your, your product volumes. And you say, well, I don't really have great data below for 2020. Awesome. So if you can do your product volumes by product volume in 2020, if you don't know the others, what we normally recommend is you take your revenue from those years relative say, if you know that your, your, your numbers in 2020, you know your revenue in 2020, then look at for 2013, just scale it against your revenue and state what you did. And so uh, that's perfectly reasonable. And when you're putting the numbers together, it's close enough. Um, and you can merge it together like that. And so all you have to do is your volumes because we'll take it volumes and then we have, it'll calculate it back in. We also will have for the chemical template, what are the weights of PTFA, PTFE by function? So if you're using an insulator function one or as a lubricant function two, or polymerized function three, et cetera, uh, what the weights are. And so uh, our chemical template will output the number of units you can report, or you can report says kilograms or by pound. And in some cases you might do it one way or another. Imagine you make capacitors with fluoroacrylate coating. Pretty common. That's like half a fairy wings amount. And the capacitors are tiny. So you, you sell 30 million or import 30 million capacitors a year into the US, you'd report 30 million units. Or if you do the math on the fairy wing, it's 2.5 pounds of chloracolate. You'd probably report the 2.5 pounds <laughs> instead of the 30 million units. 30 million units to show up like the sun. 2.5 pounds back to me. Um, and so that's why we do both options. And you can figure out which one you have to submit. And then basically, it ends up being basically a list that this is what you're going to type in. And um, it's all basically all of these fields. Now you can choose units or kilograms or pounds, up to you. And that's it. And so we, that's how we build it. We merge, we take the, we create the, get the data. Um, and then from the data, we create the chemical templates. And the chemical templates, we have them merge with the volumes. And then so what you normally just have to do is what's your product volume? And it all maps together. And that's how we do the project. So you can stick with what, you know, specialized in like what you sell and the amount you sell, and then it all merges into what you can actually put into CDX. Clear as mud. When in doubt, we'll just take care of it for you. Um, state level reporting is slightly different. Maine and Minnesota, Maine in particular is gonna be by a customs code. Um, we're probably gonna do by six digit, probably get away six digit uh, customs code. They're asking for eight, they're probably six. Uh, it's more effective. Um, unfortunately, the their, the interstate clearinghouse system where they're supposed to put it in is not open yet. So we can't. Some of the fields are a little bit open ended, like concentration. Is it because they say quantity, then they say concentration. Is it number of grams? Is it going to be percent by component? Is it percent by product? Like, what are you going to do here? So we have our templates a little bit open ended on that. But everything we're doing here, we have separate templates reporting to state level. So everything we do here for federal, it's just a different template, full extra effort and cost. To, to then change around for state level reporting. We'll try to merge it into customs code. And by customs code, you're gonna have to uh, identify similar to federal, but they don't have the same pull down menus or at all, um, what the uses are by um, uh, PFAS. So basically you're now reporting refrigerator, you have PTFE in refrigerators. This is the use of PTFE in refrigerator. But federally, well, we do three phases, identify the PFAS in your products, and we can do that for you. We do it through representative testing, it's great. Uh, we create these chemical templates. If you think you have great data, we can do the phase two and phase three only, but it's gonna be actually more effort um, than normal to do phase two and phase three, because we have to fix all the data and make it consistent before we can use it. Um, phase three is then we can merge in your sales volume and then correct for the fact that you're the only, the importer for a certain percentage of your products, not the amount total, and then we correct for all that. Uh, basically, we take it. We have some conversations with you and take care of it for you. And you can say you play around the numbers and be like, does it really matter if you're going to you're going to declare three thousand units, thirty eight hundred? So you'll find sometimes you're playing around the numbers. Like, I don't know if this really makes any difference. It what makes difference is difference between n units, hundred units, a thousand units, ten thousand. Same thing with with tonnage. Like, there's a big difference between a pound, ten pounds, a hundred pounds, a thousand pounds, and ten thousand pounds, etc. And then eventually, if your chemical supply is like ten thousand tons. Very different. So um, definitely recommend reach out for a quote. Uh, we were very detailed with exactly what we're going to do. This is exactly what we're going to do in great detail. Even if you don't necessarily go with us, make me sad. Um, but you know exactly what to give. And a lot of times your boss would probably ask me how much it's going to cost, how long it's going to take. Do a little recommendations to ask for a quote. Or buy. I'm biased. I'm a little slang here, biased. Um, but definitely we're really good at this. Why? It's not a commitment. But it is a solution. It'll work. And I'll tell you how much. Because somebody's going to be asking you again, how much and how long. 
and this will give you an answer. It may not be the answer you go with. I definitely recommend it. It's going to be the best, lowest effort. Um, and it's going to be what lots of other people are doing. The nice thing about it, when we're doing it for you, it's not like the 10th time we've done it or the 20th time. It's more than that. Um, so you get to benefit from all the experience of everybody else. And if there's anything wrong with it, which I don't expect, everybody's at least wrong together. Then nobody's really wrong, which is quite handy. So again, everybody who registered will receive a copy of these slides. And I'm not ending yet. Um, and there will be a recording of this um, available soon. I'm going to get to questions in a moment. Questions, just feel free to put in questions in the control panel. If I don't get to yours, feel free to follow up with us later and we'll be happy to answer. Uh, we'll to, okay. Uh, great question. Hybrid career seminar. The way I understand it, if I need to report PFAS, uh, US EPA, I'm only required to report articles that may contain PFAS if they're sourced from international entities. Mostly, I'll explain. Second question, if I purchase articles from US distributors, are the distributors responsible for identifying PFAS procured from international entities? Yes. Yeah, so you only technically have to do what you imported which could be full products, could be components. Uh, what we find out if there's a mix, it's often not worth bothering. Because um, especially with a lot of different products is um, you basically make, here's your deck here. If you have to de declare for something, here's the template for that something. And then you just modify what percentage of your sales you're reporting for. So basically saying, hey, uh, refrigerators, uh, we have quite a few lines of it. Um, we have one line we import from China. The other ones we manufacture here, mostly from, from uh, domestic suppliers, a small percentage we import ourselves. So you're basically saying, hey, when you do the product volume, we put a modifier and you only end up reporting volumes for 20% um, plus a maybe 5% of the remaining 80%, saying you just import a few extra parts yourself. So you end up reporting, um, you use the chemical templates and then you take the sales volume and it ends up only reporting 24% of your sales being your responsibility. Again, there's a lot of duplication. Once you're reporting a refrigerator, whether you once you're having to report a refrigerator because you brought some in, not going to be that much different from the other refrigerators. Because again, duplication doesn't make much difference. It's just a matter of changing your volume. So we basically don't sweat the small things. If you know everything's incorporated in in the US, you make the whole you incorporate the whole product in the US and everybody and your distributors do all the importation, then sure, don't report that. Uh, but second start reporting something, it's just a matter of duplication. So you only have to do the ones that you import in the US. Uh, how much do monthly quarterly consultations cost? I uh, just reach out, it's the same for everybody. I remember it's like something like $600 a quarter. Uh, but it's really good because you sit down with just you and your stakeholders, you can ask any questions you want. You also get um, the risk assessments to every list updates. So like the, the new one coming up with dicobal peroxide for the SVHC and uh, triphenyl phosphate, um, whether they'll actually be in your product and if they do where and why. Um, you get all those too. So it, it's, it's something that effect. It's really good, you know, for like a couple thousand dollars a year. And what we do is we explain it all. It isn't just like, hey, this is the change. Sometimes we say, hey, this is the change. This is the reason why most of it doesn't apply to you for this reason. Or yes, it is there, but it, this chemical can't be, you know, above a uh, certain concentration of your product. And this is why. It's UV curing. And this is the whole reason why it won't be declarable in your product. Um, they're really good. Uh, what, are these what's required for article importers using a streamlined process? Yes, I did put in the option of whether you want to report number of units or by weight, because um, sometimes you might want one over the other and we just leave the option open. You can decide at the end. Uh, but yes, this is a streamlined process. The chemical process is slightly different um, because they have to do weights and in, in concentrations, but um, it's similar enough actually. In some ways it's easier, the other one. <laughs> Uh, well, okay, here's a good question. We have two divisions, one who manufactures directly sells and one who also distributes that product along with the products of other companies. Should only one division report? It depends what you're importing. Um, if it's roughly the same product, then you you definitely report, you, you base everything on the one division. And then if the other division has a certain percentage, uh, they import of other people's, you can likely say, hey, are they roughly similar to ours? We can just then tack on some additional volume um, say, hey, what else they, they sell? Is it the other product, you know, 10% of what they sell is the import, very similar product to our own. Let's just add that extra volume to our report. There's no reason to believe that different. They say, well, the product's a little bit different. I'm like, well, how different is your product in 2024 from your 2011 version? So we're using this data to go back to 2011. Um, and if you haven't controlled PFAS, it could or may or may not have been there all the time. We might ask, in some certain industries, we ask some questions saying, hey, you know, we make laptops, but we don't have hard drives. Yeah, but when did you change? When did you get out of hard drives? Oh, well, only about three or four years ago. Okay, so we're going to add some hard drive placeholders in because they have different chemicals. 
Uh, will there be ability to mark unknown in certain situations, the actual data needed? Well, you can't really mark unknown. You can make unknown for the function, but we can, we'll solve that. Um, but you can't say unknown for the PFAS. There's isn't really a way. To, well, I guess you can write it in, but really it's not, not supposed to. Um, it's amazing what you could type in manually. Um, but there's ways to handle it. And there's certain things like fluoroacrylates, which don't actually have a cast number. So they have to be written in that way. Um, but we'll help you. We just tell you what for, or what's the most reasonable reason because it's reasonably ascertainable. So for sometimes we have PTFE as a coating on a piece of metal. It's not 100% sure whether that's for environmental resistance or for friction resistance, because it does both. So the best reason, and in, in some cases it does two different things. When you have a, a, a metal painted part, it often have PTFE in the outer coating, which makes it weather resistant, but it also makes it low friction, which has two different uses. Those are actually two different functions. So we say half and half. So there's a whole reason behind that. Uh, for CDX reporting, can one person report from multiple sites of the company? Oh, so, so it's just CDR is sites, so like your affluent. CDX is you report for the company. Um, but of course, you can put any granularity of company you want, um, especially when if you, if, if you ever want your brain to explode and your company's been around a long time with a lot of acquisitions, you'd probably be mind to be blown how many legal entities you really have in the United States. So you can probably use granular as you feel like. There's probably some justification somewhere. Um, uh, but yes, you can separate, you can report by product line separately if you want. Um, you can have two different people attached to the same company actually and report separately for different business lines. So you have that ability too. It's in there. Um, when you go in the system, like and when I look at mine, mine's attached to Clegan. Um, but you can attach multiple people. Like, so myself or a lot of you guys know Chris Scully or whomever, our manager of engineering, we would both be attached to Clegan and can report different pieces separately actually in parallel. So there's a lot of option if, even though it's both under Acme, even that's the company or, or Thurman Steels under Acme has two different product divisions. They could theoretically report separately, but you report your PTFE, which is really around your products, but you're reporting PTFE. And you could have two different groups in the same company, both report PTFE separately just report their volume perfectly fine because you just attach two different uh, entities in there now it might be a little tricky if they're both acme um I haven't, we haven't tried that before but it should be possible of course system isn't up yet so we can't try some detail like that what fines exist for inaccurate reporting it's the epa the epa has incredible enforcement power um but it, it's reasonably ascertainable so you, you have to be able to show you've done it in good faith and it's the first time it's ever been done so you just have to say, you tr show, show you try, not say you try, but people show you try. So everything we do, by the way, is recorded. Um, people don't also notice it because we email you in the outside world, but internally we use a ticketing system. Everything we do internally is a ticketing system. Every project we've ever done for you is a ticketing, is a ticketing. We have the history of all the interaction and all the documents ever happened. So um, it's really useful because years later, we go back and see what we did. And we have questions about the product, which is very important. Um, so PFAS information going back 13 years. So we normally assume, hey, is your product kind of similar enough? There's a few key questions than it was before. So we normally suggest using today's products and just adjust it for your sales volume going backwards. Because if you haven't controlled PFAS before, you could or may or may not have some variation what you have today. Um, but as long as you do it accurately, it's fine. But the big difference, say, for if you're a laptop maker, is now your solid state is a very different technology. And hard drive. Hard drive is a very different reportable. Why did you switch over hard drives? Roughly here. So we'll make a small adjustment in your reporting for, for the laptop. Uh, if one of the US sites closed in 2020, do I still have to report? Well, it's not just the site, it's the product line. So you're reporting the product line. Uh, yes and no. So it has to be reported. So a couple of things could happen. You could, the product, you could no longer make it. If it's similar to your some other product you still make, you basically find a way to include its sales volume into its chemical template. Uh, if it's very different, if you've sold it to someone else, it's their problem. If you've closed it, you can do best efforts, especially if you closed it years ago. Now, the best efforts are different from an article maker, a, a product manufacturer, versus a chemical manufacturer. If you used to make you know, a PTFE in a plant in you know, Virginia and you stopped doing it three years ago, they're expecting a lot of data from that. Um, but you, you make now laptops, but you used to make, I don't know, ski equipment, and you stopped doing that three years ago, and it's a little more best effort, and we can help you with that. If you sold the ski equipment line to someone else, which is normally more commonly done, it's them, and you're not really reporting by site again, you're reporting by the, the by chemical, and which is more linked to the product. So if you close the site, but you're still selling that product, it's around the product. It's a little different if you've imported now, and you didn't import then, we'd suggest, hey, what you can do is just adjust your, your volume numbers. 
Uh, if I reach out to international entities requesting PFAS information, do not hear back. Am I covered? You know, reasonably ascertained? Nope. We've got to figure a way to, to do it. Um, so that's one of the reasons. Well, supplier data is such a gap. So I would say, hey, if we do the project for it, this is exactly what we're going to do and this is how much it costs. And it's going to be expensive, but probably a lot less expensive than you think. <laughs> you just do this a lot. It's a big advantage where we're not doing billable hours because it's, it's everything we have is a process. Um, and we do it lots of times. You're not going to be the first. You're not going to be the fifth. You're, you're not going to be the 10th. You're going to be much higher than that. <laughs> um, that we're doing it for us. So you get to use a process, which is pretty proven out. Um, it's a lot easier. Do I need to report for product materials or also for processing and packaging materials? Your packaging is in scope. Will your packaging have it? Most of the time, no. Um, you'll have exceptions. So it's kind of funny. When you look at a, a blender, sometimes the blender will have, a coffee machine will have PFAS for sure. Uh, the blender uh, might not. Um, however, if you set a recipe book with it, recipe book normally is floral coated because uh, to make it um, stain resistant. It's kind of neat. Um, so that's in scope. So it, it's everything you sell. It's everything you import. Sorry, not sell. Everything you import. So if you've imported the box package, if it's somebody else's domestic packaging, it's their problem. Now, your cardboard box won't have it. One of the reasons why you don't want to get your cardboard box wet. Um, but you've made some of your labels will have it. So it's kind of neat, especially long. It's so temporary labels on a on a cardboard box, not expecting it. Labels on your product for safety reasons are going to be floral coated very often. Uh, you focus on products. What about processing aids that are not actually found in the company's products? We're only report what's what's intentionally added, and and it really needs to have a function. So if it has no longer has a function in your product, if you if you use the processing aid inside the U.S. and you imported the processing aid, you're going to have to deal with the importing of the processing aid anyway. If somebody else imported the processing aid, it's already reported. It's not your problem. If it's a processing aid somebody's used in Asia and anything is not intentionally residual in your product, it's not reportable. It's only intentional. Um, so a really common one is uh, floral elastomers, FKM, Python. Uh, almost all of it uses a surfactant called uh, of, of the capstone family. Capstone is like the Kleenex of the six carbon fluorine chain, fluorotelomer. So in fact, it's um, long chemistry and I can explain all the chemistry if you ever want to get that bored. Um, it's always going to have residual 6,2 flotelomer sulfonate in Python, I see all the time from this, but it has no function and, and, and it's not intentionally there used to make it, so it's not declarable. However, if you import the capstone surfactant to make the Viton yourself, different story, uh, but no. Uh, let's say I use PTFE across many different complex articles. Pretty common. Do you report just for the PTFE or the product family level at the part level? You report PTFE and the function. So those those things I had earlier, um, that's actually what you report. That, those Excel sheets are Google Sheets. That's actually what the data you're reporting. You're reporting PTFE. And when you do percentages, it's the product level. But you're not reporting against the product. You're just reporting PTFE. You have one submission for PTFE. Now, you can have, of course, product lines report separately if you want to but you can merge them into one PTFE. You have one PTFE submission with different functions. So 50% are like insulator, 25% flame retardant, 20% uh, friction resistance, 5% uh, seal, whatever. Um, that's what you report. But you have one listing for PTFE. Don't replace the product level. State, on the other hand, you do a customs code. We normally merge the customs code to look together at a pretty high level. So you can merge a lot together. Um, is the main reporting site open yet? No, I was funny. I was on the inter... Uh, a clearinghouse today and they have PFAS. We're working on stuff. It's like two paragraphs with no information there. So nothing really tangible is stable. The company's going to go back to 2011. What do companies do if they're a different company that got bought out? So um, what you do is if a piece got bought away from you, you leave it. Uh, that's somebody else's problem now. Um, if it's yours and you don't have data but on a certain point, what you normally recommend is you take whatever year you have the best set, uh, product volume information and then adjust it for sales as much as you can. So basically say, hey, this year where I have good information, we sold 1,200 units and I don't really have any good unit information five years ago, but we have about 80% of the sales. So I'll just use 80% of the, the 1,200 or 1,500 or whatever the volume was for the year you understood. Um, and if you can't figure it out, nobody else will either. So, but you, so again, the, the important one is magnitude, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000. So that's the key part. The CDS reporting has to be done by each entity of a company. Like one person, the parent company, report from multiple entities. Yes. Or you can merge them all together as the parent company. So Acme can report as Acme for all its operating companies. Or of the five operating companies Acme, my theoretical fictional company has, um, they can report for three of them. And then the other two, 
Thurman valves and vents and laboratory equipment to report on their own. As long as it's reported by somebody, it's fine. There isn't that granular. They all have to do it, but what level is up to you. Um, so you can separate. CDX can be, one person can also report for different entities. You just have to connect. So if you report as Benson and you report as Thurman, you're going to have to have a Thurman entity and a Benson entity to the system, and you have to connect the ID to both. And then somebody, usually a legal person or, or somebody who has signing authority and Benson has to sign a form saying you can do that. And if somebody that's signing authority, Thurman has to say, hey, so-and-so has the authority to do that. Then you submit that to the EPA and they give you access connections to both. So as long as you can get a legal document saying, you know, from the different entities that you can report for them, you can. I can report for you. Don't recommend it. I mean, I can physically do the work and sit in a thing, but you don't want me to. We're happy to do it. We don't want really somebody else to own your your your, your submission to the EPA. We can sit there and meet with you and help you and have done all the work, but you don't really want to own your own submission. Uh, where does the referred intentionally add as reporting criteria? I'll have to get back to you. It's a really good idea. Uh, has there any been any legislative legal action against the EPA to eliminate the PFAS reporting environment? It's pretty overreaching. Um, it's pretty hard to when they've if they've gone through the law to look at each. It's actually a very common, reasonable thing for chemical manufacturers. So article manufacturers are not used to it. And and then and the US also EPA can point to environment Canada and in Canada does the exact same thing. Um, you're gonna get the exact same thing in Canada, just different fields, because we're un, you know unnecessarily complicated in Canada. Um you get the same thing. So they can point the other jurisdictions do it. Um, we followed all the all the EPA rules, chemicals, people have been reporting for you know, decades. Um, it's it's it, as much as it's new for a lot of the article, many, article manufacturers. It's been around a long time. So, um, unless they have it addressed, industry feedback, which would be pretty hard to prove, because um, they create the streamline process for articles. So they even said, you know, article manufacturers made recommendations. Here's a solution. It's not a great solution, but they definitely show they they did create a simplified version, whether it's simple or not. At least attempted to for. So it'd be pretty hard to strike down. Great question though. Uh, how does long to take the wet ink signature verification back from the CDX people? So if you're not a U.S. national, submit it. Well, it's kind of funny. So what you want to do is you want to carry it. It'll go faster if it's notarized, but it doesn't have to be. Um, mine wasn't, but it, it'll go faster. And then you want a, a receipt for it so you know it gets arrived and they've got it because they won't tell you. And then it takes it took about a, two weeks maybe, to suddenly get the password. It's the first thing they say. It's okay. You're like. You'll get a CDX password. Just be, yeah, you're in the system now. You're attached to whatever. And by the way, if you attach to other reporting systems, you have to go through a similar process each time to get approved. Um, so if you do the wet ink version, like your non-US national, uh, you have to. You, I would suggest you get a, you get notarized because it's a little faster. You get a tracking on the courier to you literally courier to some guy's desk, some person's desk, and uh, you want to know what arrives, and because they're not going to tell you. And then someday, so about two weeks later or so, you're going to get a suddenly password you accept in the system magically. That's the way it works. Perfect. Well, thanks much for the questions. If I didn't get to a question a bit over time right now, feel free to reach out. And uh, again, everybody registered will get a copy of the slides, and we should have recordings available um, the next day or two. Thanks much. Oh, wait, we make medical device components that are regulated under the FDA. Our raw material is not regulated by the FDA. Is reported required for us. Okay, so in is a quick thing on EPA. If in an EPA rule like this one, it uses the word chemical substance, that's the one that's legally uh, governed by the FDA. So second, you use the word chemical substance. Chemical substance in medical devices, food contacting materials, not food contacting products, and veterinary, et cetera, are FDA regulated and therefore the chemical substance regulation is not by the EPA. So medical devices and food contact materials. So basically, if you take a blender, the part that touches food is out of scope. The rest of the blender is in. The whole medical device is FDA regulated. So out. You can report, there's a pull down menu where you can say in, uh, in CDX, you can say non-Tosca medical or non-Tosca food uh, contact as, as the application. So you can, uh, but no, if you're FDA regulated because you use the word chemical substance in the reporting, chemical substances are regulated in uh, FDA. Now the state level, different. They can't restrict it for medical devices, it looks like, we'll see. Um, but they can ask for reporting. That's perfectly valid at the state level. So medical devices still at the state level. Report. They don't have the federal one. They can choose to do it, but it's not, they're not included. There's like a field in terms of function, non-TOSCA 
uh, medical or non-toxic food or whatever it is. Great question. Thanks so much, everybody. And I look, for, I look forward to hosting everyone again soon. Feel free to reach out. Uh, easiest one, when in doubt, uh, this is our this is our company. What it costs to do the whole thing. Here it is. And then Geese gives you a timeline and a cost and a plan. And you can choose to go a different way, um, but this is either the best one. It gives you at least now a cost and timeline to plan around. Because often somebody's going to be asking you how much and how long. Perfect. Thanks again, everyone. And I look forward to hosting everyone again in the future.